September 6th. The sudden strength with which the desire to go see whether the initials I'd carved so long ago in the wood of the stall in the men's room of the art building were, were still there. The sudden and unexpected and overwhelming strength with which these feelings have washed over me there at the dormitory with Lenore was a frightening thing. As I joined the serpentine line of students walking up the ungentle hill to the art and science buildings, all of us falling into the vaguely floppy, seal-like gait of the hurried hill climber, most of us seals apparently late for class, one of us late for an appointment with a tiny ocean of his own past, stretching away and down beside the carved dock of his childhood, an ocean into which this particular seal was going to pour a strong, hopefully unitary stream of his own presence to prove that he still is and so was, that is provided of course the bathroom and toilet and stall were still there. As I joined the line of seals in short pants and loose short sleeved shirts and boat shoes and backpacks, as I felt the fear that accompanied and was in a way caused by the intensity of the wash of feelings and desires and so on that accompanied even the thought of a silly men's room in a silly building at a silly college where a sad silly boy had spent four years twenty years ago. As I felt all these things, there occurred to me a fact which I think now as I sit up in bed and in our motel room writing, the television softly on, the sharp-haired object of my adoration and absolute center of my entire existence, asleep and snoring softly in the bed beside me, a fact which I think now is undeniably true, the truth being that Amherst College in the 1960s was for me a devourer of the emotional middle, a maker of psychic canyons a whacker of the pendulum of mood with the paddle of immoderation. That is, it occurs to me from now in force that in college things were never, not ever, and no single point simply all right. Things were never just okay. I was never just getting by, never. I can remember I was always horribly afraid, or if not horribly afraid, horribly angry. I was always desperately tense. Or if not tense, then in an odd hot euphoria that made me walk with the water-jointed jaunt of the person who truly does not give a shit one way or the other. I was always either so unreasonably and pointlessly happy that no one place could seem so could seem to contain me, or so melancholy, so sick and silly with sadness that there was no place I could stomach the thought of entering. I hated it here. And I've never been as happy as when I was here. And these two things together confront me with the peak and claws of the true. One of the trees at the top of the hill, which I stopped to look at as I played with my hat and recovered from the climb, the line of students forking past either side of me and disappearing into buildings to the sound of bells. One of the trees was just beginning to burn a bit with color, a flush of hesitant red suffusing the outline of the tree against the southerly sun, the tree's blood draining out of those leaves most distant from the heart first. And I looked at the flush of crinkled red crowning a body of soft green with the sunlight winking through the branches as they moved and creaked in the breeze until I was drawn away with, by the twin urges to remember and to pee. And the initials were still there, the tiny carved RV near the bottom of the stall. Someone had filled in the carving with a ballpoint pen. Near the initials were another set of initials, S-U-X, which I come to see now were meant to be a joke at my expense. And near the joke at my expense initials, someone, some tiny soul, probably during exam time, in a gesture the emotion behind which I could completely understand had put the single word, mommy, which predictably someone else, a mean person, had altered in a slightly different color to become, your mommy hates you. She does not, I put, still being a really incorrigible graffiti man, I'm afraid. Under the cruel alteration, although I had to get on hands and knees in the scum laid and stall to do it and managed to dip my tie neatly in the toilet bowl in the process. Let Jay Blentler have a look at this. And my present bubbled and frothed in my past and was born naturally away. Out the door of the art building and through the courtyard, I pass into a quad, the quad, where loosely clothed barefoot boys with liquid wrists are playing frisbee under the lying leaves, running like deer, throwing the plastic plate every which way. We dinosaurs used to play a similar game here, but the trays taken from the dining hall. Metal trays back then, with sharp digit removing edges, so that, I remember, the trays had to be caught in mid-air with the tweezer of finger and thumb. We would play and bleed. Now they're only high-tech and beautiful, and the bright disc hangs motionless in the air while earth and trees and lithe, slippery boys slide underneath as if on oil to receive it again. I clap my hands a bit, hem and haw, throw my cap into the air, practice some motions, Make it clear that I want to be invited to play, but I am ignored. 
I walk around the quad, kicking at exposed tree roots, listening to snatches of conversations and languages with which I am unfamiliar. Still, I stay well clear of North Dormitory, to be sure. I make a giant detour around it. Out of the corner of my eye, I can see its window shades fluttering. I can see its tree fingers pointing. North Dormitory. Scene of perhaps the most single most disastrous, unthinkable moment of my life thus far. Actually, probably second to my wedding night. Whom do I see here in the quad? Can the present of a past fail to be ugly? But it isn't so. As I really should have remembered, ugliness is absent from the college. I have visions of it, bound and muffled, and in walleyes in rolling helplessly, stuffed into the darkest closets and boilers, boiler rooms, and the deepest basements of the thickest buildings. I think I can hear its soft cries for help. The crazy relative everyone ignores and denies and feeds. Ugliness is absent from the quad. Whom do I see here? I see students and adults. I see parents, obvious parents, the ones with name tags. I watch the students and they watch back. Ability to handle oneself. Elaborate defense structures. Exit their eyes and begin to assemble on the ground before them. But the eyes and faces are as always left bare. In the girls' faces I see softness, beauty, the shiny and relaxed eyes of wealth, and the vital capacity for creating problems where none exist. For some reason I see these girls also older, pale television ghosts flickering beside the originals, middle-aged women with bright red fingernails and deeply tanned, hard, seamed faces, sprayed hair shaped by the professional fingers of men with French names, and eyes, eyes that will stare without pity or doubt over salted tequila rims at the glare of the summer sun off the country club pool. The structures spread out, grow. The structures spread out, grow, wave at me with the epileptic flutter of the film in reverse. The boys are different, appropriately from the girls, from each other. I see blonde heads and lean jaws and bow-legged swaggards and biceps with veins in them. I see so many calm, impassive, or cheerful faces. Faces at peace, for now and always, with the context of their own appearance and being, that sort of long-term peace and smooth acquaintance with invariable destiny that renders the faces bloodlessly pasteable onto cutouts of corporate directors in oak-lined boardrooms, professors with plaid ties and leather patches on the elbows of their sports jackets, doctors on bright putting greens with heavy gold shock-resistant watches at their wrists and tiny beepers at their belts, black-jacketed soldiers efficiently bayoneting the infirm. I see best faces too, faces I remember well. Faces whose owners are going to be the very best. I see the faces of those who belong and those who do not belong. The belonging faces appear in rows like belts of coins. The coins bob up and down because belongers swagger. The belonging faces are tiringly complex. The expression of each created and propped up through the process is obscure by the faces on either side of it. These structures intertwine and mesh, have not yet begun to tear one another, and the non-belongers. Of course, the faces of those who do not belong are the adjustable dark-eyed faces of Vance Vigorous. Many of these faces are tilted downward for fear of tripping on a root, for fear of being seen tripping on, tripping on a root. These are the ones who do not, do not sleep, sleep soundly, sleep alone, and think of other things when they hear the sounds through the walls of their rooms. I intuit that the frisbee players, who I continue to watch, are non-belongers. The frisbee traces faint lines between them, strands that are swept and snapped like spider silk by the wind off the memorial hill and athletic fields to the south. The non-belongers' faces are the unfirm faces that are really firm, the self-defined faces, the faces defined by non-belonging in a place defined by belonging. These alone are the faces that stare out, protected and imprisoned from behind the barbed borders of their own structures. Faces that know that, but for the grace of a God distinguished for the arbitrariness of his grace, it is they who would be bound and muffled in the college closets. The faces that are unreachable from this far away, and that look through you and digest you in a moment against everyone's will. Who knows how long I watch. My pant coasts fill with leaf bits and clippings of hollow stemmed grass. Parents go by with their name tags. Older men for whom bellies are burdens wrapped and hefted in checked sports coats. Older women I have already seen and known in the faces of their daughters. Seals on hills, bright discs in the air. Lovers on stomachs, legs up, ankles lazily crossed against the fluttering approach of the odd, odd falling leaf. The sun moves out over the mountains. I am able to feel it. 
the ellipse of my quad orbit orbits absorbs the indentation of North Dormitory. Oh, why the hate? Why, when a horrible, worse than worse thing happens to you, when in all honesty you do something horrible, why is it the situation and the context of which the thing happens, the physical place where it happens, the other people whom it involves, that you hate, the thought of which and whom sends organs leaping inside you, and corridors in your brain clanging shut against the assault? Why is it not yourself whom you hate, the mirror away from which you reel in horror? Can Jay explain this? What an entirely inappropriate question. How very far I've come. On 2, soon to be 3rd of March 1968, North Dormitory, of which I was a resident, sponsored a mixture of the junior class, of which I was a member. And for the residents of our sister dormitory at Mount Holyoke College, an all-women's institution 10 miles away, the institution of the North sister and grandmother, mother too, I think, had all passed through. In attendance at this mix mixer was a Mount Holyoke sophomore named Janet Dibden, a small, quiet, curved girl, straight red hair and blue eyes with tiny, fluffy white diamonds in the irises. Really. A girl about whom I was privately wild. A girl I met at another mixer and another of the year's endless string, this one at Mount Holyoke. And at this mixer I had met her and had survived the agony of dancing with her. And so. And so this was a girl in whose presence I was stupid, damp, tongue-tied, and comparatively huge. One of the three females in my life to whom I have been overwhelmingly sexually attracted, the others being Lenore Beadsman and the daughter of my next door neighbor in Scarsdale, Rex Metalman's daughter, an objectively erotic young thing who undulated her way into my heart in the summer of her 13th year while ostensibly playing with the sprinkler on the lawn. In any event, there we were, grouped in blue suits and gray suits and slicked back hair and shiny nervous noses. And there were they, a sweet shifting miasma of wool, shaped hair, cashmere, eyes, cotton, calves, and pearls, in the midst of in the midst of which she stood, by the hors d'oeuvres bar, in a skirt and monogram sweater, talking quietly with friends, conspicuously danceless all night. And it was close to twelve, and there we were in suits, gathering our saliva for the final assault. And there we were, moving through geologic time, and possibly slowly, imperceptibly across the cedar floor, the fire in the fireplace doubtless, and not inappropriately reflected and dancing in the centers of our eyes. We moved, and I was suddenly beside her, talking to her, good heavens hello, pretending it be by accident, lest all dissolve, one or two of her friends standing with towering hairdos off to the side, wary lest they become the ropes of sexual tension that snapped and crackled in the air between Janet and me friends watching us, me, for the tiniest air, the Beatles on the record playing eight days a week, and my hands prepared some sort of hors d'oeuvres, do I mean some sort, a fastened cylinder of bologna on a Ritz cracker. She declined it, stared at me kindly, telling me with her eyes that she was willing to play the elaborate and exhausting game, that it was all right, and I put the hors d'oeuvres into my mouth, and the crackers seemed to explode into deserts of dust, and there was meat, and I recall she was talking about the upcoming election. The unavoidable and untalkaboutably horrible invitation to dance began its salmon migration from my intestine up towards my brain, and my hand was in my pocket of my slack, soaking through the wool, and in a disastrous flash I thought of something witty to say to delay the invitation, and my heart leapt and my throat constricted, and I turned convulsively from myself to say the thing to Janet Dibden, as she stared with undeserved trust into my eyes, and I tried to say the thing, and as I opened my mouth, there somehow flew out of my mouth an enormous glob of chewed hors d'oeuvres. The Ritz cracker and bologna chewed with saliva in it with shocking force, and it flew out and landed on the fleshy part of Janet Dibden's nose and stayed there, and the friends were blasted into silence, and the rest of hors d'oeuvres in my mouth turned to ice, adhered forever to my palate, and the Beatles sang, Guess you know it's true. And Janet stopped all life processes, virtually killed with horror, which she out of a compassion not of this earth tried to hide by smiling. She began to look in her purse for a Kleenex, with the obscenely flesh and bone colored glob of chewed food on the end of her nose. And I watched it all through the large end of a telescope. And then the world ceased mercifully to be, and I became infinitely small and infinitely dense, a tiny black star twinklingly negatively amid a crumple of empty suit and shoes. This was my taste of hell at 20. The month following that night is an irretrievable blank in my memory, an expletive deleted. That portion of my brain is cooked smooth. 
An unprecedentedly enormous veer around North Dormitory, affected with hands over ears, flings me out past Memorial Hill and into the bleeding forest south of the campus. And I wander crunching needles in the weak leaves already down as I used to wander alone for hours as a student, elbowing through the throngs of other students wandering alone as I elbow students and parents aside now and head for the really isolated and natural part of the New England forest, beyond the road past dry fields of baking, screaming crickets, out through the wind, elbowing to find the really scheduled places already full, lines of belongers cracking like whips around the sap sprung trees, sending non-belongers spinning into the bush. I am outside, and I wait my turn for admission and smoke two clove cigarettes under the angry eye of a blue-haired mother in a yellow bonwit pantsuit unfortunately right downward from me, hissing into the ear of his son with a note concerning a laundry pinned to the sleeve of his brand new Amherst jacket. I buy a hot dog from a vendor and watch the sun glitter far away against the windows of the buildings on the southern face of the broad ridge, the south, southern wall of the, the citadel. One of my RVs was still there, and I had in the back of my mind one other place where I might still be. These things somehow made me unreasonably happy. As happy as seeing in the immoderate curve of Lenore's hip under a scratchy Howard Johnson's blanket here next to me. I love you, Lenore. There's no hatred in my love for you. Only a sadness I feel all the more strongly for my inability to explain or describe it. My ears rumble still.